Good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to welcome you to the last session of today, um, which is on forest sector transparency. My name is Stefan Lackmann. Uh, I'm working in the International Forest Policy Program um, at GIZ headquarters in Germany. Yeah, I'm happy to welcome you to this session for a sector transparency and we have a particular focus today on contractual and revenue transparency. We will hear four speakers um, who will present on this topic um, in the context or at least in, the, in relation of the EITI, that is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, but from rather different perspectives, including um, the EU perspective and what the particular EU reporting requirements are for, these, um, for, this, for this industry. We will hear the VPA perspective and we will hear the country-specific perspective on the case um, of Myanmar. As in the other sessions before, we will first hear pr the presentations uh, and then we will open the floor for questions and discussions. With this, I would like to welcome our first speaker, uh, Clotilde Henriot from Client Earth, who is a law and policy advisor in their climate and forest team. And she will present on the obstacles to the applicability of the EU company reporting rules in the logging sector. Welcome, Clotilde. Hello everyone, um, thank you for having me here. Um, first of all, uh, people used to say that the French accent is uh, cute and lovely. Usually people say about me that it's just very strong. So I have colleagues and friends in the room, so wave at me if I start to become uh, just uh, no one can understand me. Thank you. So basically to start uh, this presentation, there will be, the idea here will be first to discover what is uh, the country by country reporting requirement for the extractive as well as the logging sector. Then um, what are the objectives of uh, this requirement uh, as well as uh, the objective of uh, this reporting requirement, particularly on how uh, those objectives have been achieved in the logging sector. Um, we will look also, uh, thanks to a consultation we have managed to do in uh, four uh, countries in Western Central Africa, uh, have an idea on uh, how civil society members are aware of those requirements uh, in the logging sector. And we will also look at the main obstacles in the logging sector <coughs> to have a greater effectiveness of this uh, country by country reporting requirement. And finally, I will let you know just at the uh, next steps at EU level in relation to particular to this reporting requirement. To start with, the country per country um, reporting requirement has been introduced um, by uh, two directives at EU level in 2013, um, named the Accounting and the Transparency Directive. Uh, basically, the reason why it's been introduced in two different uh, directives is mainly uh, due to uh, be able to incorporate a different type of uh, companies. In relation then to the scope of the companies, we have the listed and large non-listed companies that are active in the oil, gas, mining, and logging sectors. Basically, in terms of large non-listed company, it's a matter of uh, meeting some criteria in relation to uh, the revenues of the company, the number of employees, a different set of criteria. In terms of the requirements that has been asked uh, from those companies uh, since uh, the introduction of, uh, of uh, uh, those new obligations, the idea is to have report on, pay on all payments made to governments broken down by country. Uh, report by project, where when payments are attributed to a specific um, country. So the idea is that companies uh, will have to disclose their revenues payments to government around the world. And, and, uh, and also on a project by project basis. Then the type of payments that are listed in the regulation. Uh, we talk about production and payments, tax on income, production or profit, royalties, license fees, rental fees, or for example, payment for instructure improvements. Uh, there is so far, 
I think a lack of uh, guidelines to understand the, uh, the, the interpretation of all those payments, but we hope in the future to make some progress on that. Um, we are talking about uh, a single payment as well as a series of related payments. And an important fact as well, particularly for the logging sector, we are talking about all payments from 100,000 uh, euros uh, and over um, by a company uh, to a government within a financial year. At the very beginning, where, when those reporting requirements were introduced, uh, the objectives were set uh, loud and clear um, within the directive and uh, with all communication made by uh, the, Com the European Commission afterwards. It's to improve transparency of payments made to governments by the extractive and the logging industry. Basically, with the aim to help civil society members to all governments to account for income made in relation to the exploitation of their natural resources. Um, they are, we are talking about civil society members, but they were also at the time targeting uh, communities and to make sure that there is um, um, a good understanding of uh, um, the, the, where the money goes after the, the exploitation of natural resources. And then in relation for the, to the, particularly to the extractive sector, that was to promote the adoption of the extractive industry transparency initiative, which is a non-binding initiative, but the other presentations are focusing uh, more on this one, so I will uh, not go further in the exploitation of this initiative, but also to complement FLECTI and particularly uh, the EUTR, um, because basically, uh, obviously, FLECTI, including the EUTR, um, have the aim to increase transparency in, uh, in the forestry uh, sector. So now becomes the slide which uh, you will all become slightly depressed for a few seconds, but then it will get better. So in the logging sector, there has been two reports which uh, have been published in 2018. Uh, one specifically done after a, cons a public consultation done by the European Commission. Um, Within this particularly one, it, is, it has been mentioned that, unfortunately, this reporting requirement was largely seen as ineffective in the logging sector. And unfortunately as well, in another study that has been released um, approximately at the same time at the end of 2018, and a study which, uh, which was laid by consultants um, that worked um, on, on a study particularly on this uh, reporting requirement. We can see here with those numbers that uh, when the consultant looked out to see how many reports were existing in the logging sector, there were only two report forms for 71 companies, and while for the extractive sectors, they were able to form 70 reports among 114 extractive companies. There has been other academics uh, that have found also extremely low reports in the logging sectors. And uh, even ourselves, when we replied to the European Commission consultation, we could only find uh, two reports. Uh, so the, the, the same kind of findings that uh, other uh, consultants. And within the consultation we made, um, we made this consultation thanks to, to, to um, some help of, uh, of client uh, member in, uh, in Ghana, Côte d'Ivoire, Liberia and the Republic of Congo. Uh, when we ask uh, to which extent civil society members were aware of uh, this reporting requirement and, and if they have ever used this type of information, uh, unfortunately there was only uh, two members of civil society uh, that uh, was able to say that they were aware of this particularly uh, EU legislation and uh, non uh, civil society members in the logging sector have used this type of information so far. So again this slide uh, could look a bit depressive but it's more to look on the positive side on the fact that the extractive sector it is working uh, we can find reports, we can find uh, the fact that the objective of the regulation is uh, more or less achieved because civil society members in producing countries have the opportunity to use uh, these reports. So again, unfortunately, a very low awareness in the logging sector, a better awareness though in the extractive sector. 
And uh, it's important to notice that, like I was saying just a, a second before, that the local civil society organizations are already using the reports uh, in the instructive sector, particularly to detect inconsistency between payments reported by companies and payments received by governments. I think there is one point interesting here is that the regulation and the aim of the regulation was really to be able to uh, add into account governments, but in fact it, uh, it appeared that um, uh, civil society members are also questioning companies. Uh, so that's uh, very interesting to see that there is an exchange which is happening at, uh, uh, between all the stakeholders. And they are, uh, for some of them, uh, requesting clarification from government's bodies. And also one of the main aspects is to be able to raise uh, public awareness so far about uh, these uh, um, uh, payments reported. Uh, and uh, of course, all of that can be achieved and will uh, mainly depend on the freedom of civil society in the, the producing countries that, uh, uh, are where the, those payments reported are, um, are mentioned, because if uh, the civil society uh, needs to have the opportunity to hold the governments accountable, basically. You are probably questioning why so far we can't see the same type of result for the logging sector. And um, uh, based on the consultation we made and based by a few more information on the legislation itself, I think it will become more and more clearer. The main obstacle are, first of all, it's due to the scope of the directive uh, itself um, because it targets the logging in primary forests and uh, the definition that is used is uh, the one that you can see on the screen. And uh, when um, we know those facts, but uh, obviously there was a few obstacles that were mentioned to us. First of all, in some countries, the only notion of primary forest is um, they just say that it, don't, it doesn't exist anymore. That's something, bring back, for example, that we got uh, from Côte d'Ivoire or from Ghana, very, very, very few percentage, and I think it's even that is uh, questionable. And um, also in terms of logging in primary forest, uh, obviously, depending on the classification done in producing countries, Mm, luckily, very few primary forests uh, can be logged uh, for commercial purposes because they are protected. And uh, finally, even within the, the, the core of the legislation of uh, forest legislation, um, it's unlikely in most places that you are able to log in primary forest. So the scope in itself answers a lot of the questions that you are probably asking yourself during this presentation. Then we have, uh, in relation to the scope of the companies, um, there is a belief that this, the, the regulation was set up uh, particularly in the mind of the extractive sector, where we are talking about a lot of um, vertical companies, uh, which are uh, large multinational, where uh, EU companies operating in the logic sector are uh, not all the time, but sometimes, however, uh, more targeted, are more uh, medium and, and small size uh, companies. So here again, we have another issue. Um, and uh, in relation to the type of payment, we have been told uh, by civil society members in Western Central Africa that it will be great uh, to make sure that all type of payments in relation to the logging, logging activities uh, were mentioned uh, in uh, import, uh, export, more likely, export taxes, um, um, any type of relation in fees with the production of, of timber and the harvest of, uh, the harvest of timber. Um, and also potentially uh, any payments made in terms of uh, corporate social responsibility. Um, and the threshold as well of uh, 100,000 that I was mentioning previously has been mentioned as a concern, uh, particularly in the logging sector. People were mentioning that this threshold has to be uh, uh, reduced quite significantly if we want to capture um, all the type of logging sector happening in producing countries. Uh, finally, there is no 
a common central database to find those reports. So we can imagine that in the future, uh, if this, uh, regu those regulations are reviewed and amendment passed uh, to improve its efficiency, uh, we should find a way to make sure that all those reports are easily accessible so that civil society members can be aware of it. And, and it's something that has been also exp um, explicitly mentioned by uh, the uh, civil society members uh, working more with the extractive industry. So we hope that it's a message that is coming along. And finally, there is the idea of raising awareness uh, all in all to make sure that uh, civil society members in producing countries are aware of this, regu of, of, uh, this uh, reporting requirement. Finally, uh, to end on a positive note, there will be, so first of all, there has been those two reports uh, published. Those two reports um, really mentioned uh, the obstacles that uh, have just been raised now during this presentation. So now the hope is that uh, some action will be taken on uh, those obstacles. First of all, uh, there is a need to ensure that um, the, the regulation is not, uh, I think we say, watered down. Yeah, thank you. So it's not what are done to start with. And secondly, make sure that for the logging sector, it's uh, much more how the logging sector is uh, working and uh, make sure that like that the civil society member can really um, uh, hold a government table like the, the first time of the, the, the reporting requirement was there for. Uh, in terms of next step at EU level, so currently, apparently, it's like the election of the Pope. Things are uh, still a bit in the air. We have no idea of uh, who will be, uh, the, how will look like the new, the new commission would look like, uh, but we hope to have more clarity in the upcoming days. And based on that, it means that we can imagine uh, to do some good raising awareness with uh, the new commission, with the new MEPs, and uh, that uh, we have a potential for a new legislative proposal let's say by end 2019 or uh, 2020. I will let you know that uh, next year if I have the opportunity to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clotilde, for this very clear presentation. Um, our second speaker, I first have to check. As I understood she's joining us over Skype, over video. Marie-Ange Kalenga is the technical setup mate. Hello. Yes, great. Can so, you hear me? Hello, Marie-Ange. Can you hear hello. me? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. <laughs> so Marie-Ange Kalenga works for Fern. She uh, works on forest and development issues with a focus on the Congo Basin. Um, she is a sociologist and has a lot of experience um, working in the NGO and development sector, and especially she has been working with different transparency initiatives, such as this um, uh, EITI, Transparency International, as well as the Publish What You Pay Coalition. So with that experience, she will um, give, her, give us a little bit more background on what the EITI is, and um, will present the context of the VPAs. Um, okay, yeah, as you heard, Marie is going to present over Skype. Uh, Marie, welcome and please go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry you'll have to hear another speaker with a francophone accent, <laughs> uh, but uh, I hope um, that works for you. Uh, so uh, I will provide you with an overview of the Forest, forest revenue transparency regime under the VPAs and the EITI, first looking at the similarities and some of the differences between the two initiatives, um, delving into um, the specific requirements of the VPAs and EITI when it comes to information about revenues. I will also um, share some of the main trends, including progress and obstacles, provide a couple of examples of countries uh, that have made progress, the most progress, and end up with some recommendations on how countries can fulfill their transparency promise. 
So first of all, uh, you're all very familiar with the VPAs, uh, of course. Uh, they are a trade agreement and their purpose is to ensure that timber and timber products uh, exported to the EU are legal. Uh, they also aim to improve uh, governance in the forest sector and to uh, stop illegal logging. The VPAs are really born from uh, the um, illegal logging crisis as such. The Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative is a global norm. It's born out of the, um, the um, discussions and the, the debate around the resource curse, and it really aims to bring a more transparency and more light into the extractive sector, which who has been, who had been, who was very opaque for, for several years. Uh, it's a standard because it's not binding, as um, Clotilde said, but rather than binding, we can say that it's not a voluntary, it's not volunt it's voluntary, meaning that countries can sign up to implement the ITI standards, but once they have a VR, then they're obliged to meet the eight requirements, and the core requirement is, of course, revenue transparency. So uh, a couple of um, similarities between the VPAs and the EITI, um, they are they, they're both uh, seek to uh, advance transparency and governance in uh, the extractive sector for the ITI and in, uh, for the VPAs, it's the logging um, sector. The VPA is about legality. Uh, the EITI is not about legality. It's really about uh, publishing information, information that's been reconciled. Um, Countries are implementing or negotiating a VPA. In the context of the EITI, we talk about a candidate country, which means it's a, a country that has joined the EITI, but that has not um, completely fulfilled its requirements. Compliant countries, on the other hand, are countries that have met all of the EITI requirements, and you can also have suspended countries, but I'll come back to that later. In terms of the governance of the process, um, in the VPAs, you have, of course, the Joint Implementation Committee, which provides oversight. In the case of the EITI, it's uh, really interesting because you have a multiple level of governance. At the national level, you have what is called a multi-stakeholder group, which includes civil society. That's a bit the equivalent of the Joint Implementation Committee of the VPAs, but you also have an international secretariat which provides technical support to countries implementing the VPA and provide also oversight on, on validation, which is um, a process through which uh, the EITI International Board verifies that a country is making progress and is meeting the EITI requirements. In the VPAs, you've had, of course, the Independent Auditor and the Independent Forest Monitor functions, which actually um, help to ensure that, to, to assess whether companies and the governments are effectively respecting forest legislation. So this is a map of the VPA countries in the world. I mean, you basically, I'm sure you know all of them. Uh, there are countries that are negotiating a VPA and there are countries that are implementing a, a VPA. In terms of the countries that are implementing a VPA, the Central African Republic, the Republic of Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Guyana and Liberia have all included forestry and the EITI scope, which means that they are committed to um, publishing information on revenues about the forest sector. Uh, however, it's only Liberia and Congo that have reported some information so far. Marie, sorry to interrupt. Can you stop the screen share or remove this little window on the top right? because we can... Um, oh, you can see it. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Is it okay now? Perfect. Great. Okay, so this is a map of the EITI countries. There are 51 uh, of them currently. So the colors differentiate between the level of um, progress. The dark green are the countries who are making significant progress, satisfactory progress, and light green these are the countries who are making meaningful progress. I mean, it's a little bit of a jargon, but there is a, a methodology to assess how well these countries are meeting their EITI obligations. The countries in blue are the countries who haven't been uh, assessed yet against the 2006 
uh, EITI standard. Um, yes, because something I didn't say is that the EITI standard is evolving um, across the year. And that's why today some countries have decided to include forestry in their EITI scope. And the countries in orange are have been either suspended or um, have been um, uh, or haven't made uh, satisfactory progress. Unfortunately, Liberia was uh, recently suspended, and it's really unfortunate because they are one of the most advanced when it comes to forest revenue transparency. So, two countries that are that have included EI, uh, forestry in their EIT scope but are not BPA countries include Malawi and Myanmar. Both the EITI and the VPAs claim to bring uh, governance and reputational benefits. I'm not going to go into detail um, um, on this slide, but it's it's really quite obvious. It's um, international image improvements in the international image, creating a level playing field. And uh, what is really also unique about both the EITI and the VPAs is that they promote multi-stakeholder dialogue uh, and they instigate a number of reforms in uh, the extractive and logging sector. So what are the transparency requirements under the EITI? Um, the EITI actually um, asks countries to make sure that the government publishes the payments they receive from companies extracting either oil, mining or gas, and in some cases, uh, in some cases, uh, logging. And uh, they also, the ITA also requires that company publish the payments they make to the government. And that's what's really unique about the EITI, it's that it's about payments and revenues. And this information is reconciled by an independent, what is called an independent administrator. It's like an accountant, which verifies that there are no discrepancies and verifies the, the quality of the data, whether it's been audited, etc., the timeliness of the data. The EITI is also unique because it requires quite some level of disaggregation in addition to um, uh, comprehensive information about the taxes of revenues. Of course, this can depend from country to country depending on the tax legislation, but generally it covers um, payments from uh, state-owned enterprises, subnational payments in cases of uh, in, in cases where this, uh, these uh, subnational payments exist. Uh, it also requires information about um, other revenue collected in kind. So it's very, very, very um, comprehensive. In terms of the level of disaggregation, it's at company level. It's not yet at project level, but the EITI um, contemplates um, introducing a requirement for project level disclosure uh, in 2020, I think. One final point on EITI transparency requirements is that uh, the publication of forest revenue is not mandated by EITI. So this is an innovation from a number of countries, and Liberia was the first one, when the forest sector contributes significantly to the economy or to national revenues. Um, so it's not mandated per se by the EITI, which really focuses on the oil mining and gas sector. In terms of the VPA transparency requirements, I think uh, the audience um, must be familiar with them. Most um, VPAs include what is called uh, a transparency annex and that transparency annex um, provides um, the list of documents but also information that a country needs to be made public. The list, the transparency annex was usually negotiated uh, by the multi-stakeholder groups, so the, the government, civil society and companies. But the um, information that we find in most of these annexes cluster around three groups. Um, first of all, the institutional and uh, legal framework of the forest sector, the VPA process as such, uh, but also data on forest activities, including financial information. What is also what is important to note is that, of course, the independent forest monitors have played a key role uh, in countries where they exist 
to uh, stimulate the production and the publication of information about uh, the forest sector because they need that information to be able to do their work properly. So what are some of the achievements and challenges that we've seen um, in uh, the VPAs? So today, all VPA countries, partner countries, not all implementing, uh, sorry, negotiating countries, are implementing the EITI except Vietnam. And of those countries, I told you two of them are publishing information about forest revenues. Uh, Clotilde gave uh, some really interesting information about how civil society organizations are using information uh, through the EU Transparency Directive. It's a bit the same um, with, the, with the VPAs. In uh, Cameroon, the Republic of Congo and Liberia, civil society has used revenue transparency information to help communities demand more equitable benefits or to, to demand stronger governance of benefit sharing mechanisms. And uh, in some countries that are implementing the EITI and want to publish information about forest revenues, we're seeing that the government is putting pressure on companies to uh, publish information. And that is the case, for instance, in the Republic of Congo. In terms of some of the obstacles that the VPAs have faced um, to um, make information about um, forest revenues more accessible, we can uh, list administrative burden for a number of forest um, authorities. Uh, it's a lot for them to uh, disclose under, under the VPA. Uh, they don't necessarily have the appropriate information system mechanism, although in some countries that like Cameroon, but also um, Ghana, we've seen that uh, there have been efforts to um, to um, use automated system. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there is very little information on, on forest revenue transparency, on forest revenue, sorry. Uh, there is a lack, a general lack of transparency culture, and that links back to the comment Clotilde made about the differences between the extractive sector and logging companies. Logging companies are much more, much less transparent than oil, gas, and mining companies. Um, it's, it's really difficult to explain why but maybe one of the reasons why is that they are, there has been much less scrutiny over, over the years on logging companies and they were mostly blamed for um, creating environmental disasters rather than uh, their lack of transparency. But hopefully this is going to change. Of course, there's a lack of um, adequate legal framework. Um, public officials don't feel obliged to publish information and civil society really has a hard time, including the independent forest, forest monitors to access and obtain information when they request it. And of course, the official VPA website should really, really, really be um, upgraded to provide more information about revenues about and, and more information in general. So as a result, um, none of the VPAs current, or the country currently implementing a VPA are fully meeting their transparency obligations when it comes to um, forest revenue transparency. Um, with respect to the EITI, so the good news is that there is a growing number of um, national EITI processes that uh, want to shed light on, on the forest sector and uh, complement the information uh, that is made available through the VPAs in, the ca in case they are also implementing a VPA. Uh, we are seeing that some of the disclosures are publicly debating and that they are contributing to uh, the um, a better understanding of the, the forest sector. In the case of the Republic of Congo, the Independent Forest Monitor published a report looking specifically at um, taxes and at uh, fines uh, that are not necessarily being uh, paid by, com by companies. And this generated a really interesting debate around what the company should have uh, paid and about the the amount of revenues the government is losing every year uh, because uh, tax recovery is really poor. And a number of um, 
EITI, but also VP, uh, sorry, EITI countries have adopted uh, adopted a transparency law. Um, that is Nigeria, Liberia. Liberia has both a transparency law and an EITI law in, in Nigeria. And the Republic of Congo also has a transparency law. And these laws were generally triggered by, by the EITI. In terms of uh, what is a little bit worrying is that forest revenue transparency is only optional under the EITI, so it's, it's only a, a plus. Uh, it's an innovation, as they call it. It's not mandatory. Um, in the case of um, countries um, uh, that have included um, forestry in their EITI scope, we notice that most of the time the government publishes payments, but companies are a bit reluctant. So uh, these are only unilateral disclosures, so they can't really be reconciled. Um, and um, another challenge is the quality of data. Some of the companies provide information that hasn't been audited. So what's the value of that? Um, I wanted to quickly go through um, some examples, and these are the countries where we have seen the most progress. Liberia is, of course, a model. It's been pioneering um, the disclosure of uh, uh, information about forest revenues since 2009, and it has been publishing annually reports about revenues in the forest sector, um, but the quality of the data is a little bit unsatisfactory, and I'll come back to that when I show you a picture of the, an assessment made by uh, the ITI secretariat during the, uh, the latest validation of Liberia. In the case of the Republic of Congo, um, disclosure of um, forest revenues is more recent, but it's only the government who publishes um, payments made by companies. Companies are persistently refusing to disclose. And the last EITR report shows that only one company um, published what it paid to the government, and that was IFO. But the, um, the data of this company apparently is a little bit problematic because it's not been audited, but yeah, that's another story. And of course, the EITI board is a little bit worried about the situation in Congo, although it welcomed um, the progress. Uh, it lamented that because the, EI, the forest sector is so important in, in Congo, it should really, really ensure that information about revenues is published. So this is the scorecard I was talking about in Liberia. Uh, this is uh, this was done in um, during the 2015 validation. And if you look at the revenue collection box, generally um, the level of progress is satisfactory to meaningful, but the quality of the data is a little bit problematic. So this is the assessment that was done for Liberia. And this other slide shows the latest EITR report from uh, from the Republic of Congo, which covers the um, fiscal year 2016. And you see that the column from companies is almost blank, and there's just uh, the IFU or the company IFU that publishes payments. And this is the government column. So what can we say about how the EITI and the VPAs complement uh, each other. Um, first of all, the ITI um, provides a very comprehensive uh, disaggregated data, and the data is reconciled independently. So company payments are reconciled with uh, government reports. In the case of the, e, the VPA, what is interesting is that publication is, is mandatory. It's like as per the VPA is a contract, so it's binding. Uh, the second thing is that the EITI uses a combination of carrots and sticks. A country can be delisted, it can be kicked off of the EITI, it can be suspended if it doesn't respect um, its obligation and if it doesn't uh, abide to the EITI rules. We don't have such a mechanism with, uh, with the VPA, um, although um, there is technically the possibility of suspending a VPA, uh, the, a VPA. But what is interesting about the VPA that the EITI doesn't have is, of course, the independent um, auditor and um, the independent forest monitor, which helps to uh, 
um, assess whether the government and companies are respecting forest legislation. And third, the EITR encourages systematic information, um, information, meaning that the EITR really wants to ensure that transparency is mainstreamed in the extractive sector along the value chain. So from the moment um, the decision is taken to extract to how the revenues are used. In the case of the VPA, um, the information provided is maybe less uh, less technical and less complex. I don't know if you've seen an EITR report. It's really, really complicated to understand. And we've also seen that the VPA has really done a good job in terms of bringing the information down to the community levels, for instance, through the use of radio communities, simplified guides, etc. In terms of the final recommendations, um, well, there are many more than what uh, is on this slide, but in terms of the key ones, obviously transparency legislation, the transparency laws really help um, in making sure everybody publishes information, both government entities, but also uh, companies. It's really difficult for companies to understand why they have to publish information if they are not obliged to do so by law. Uh, it's also important that VPA countries start looking at some of the mechanisms that the EITR provides to disclose uh, information. For instance, the EITI portal uh, where all the ITR reports are published is really very user-friendly, it's very interactive, and it's updated on a regular basis. Uh, Currently, no VPI countries, unless I'm mistaken, maybe in the case of Ghana, the validation committee could, could play that role, but no VPA countries have a formal mechanism to assess progress on, on transparency. So that's really, really missing. So maybe they should think about um, making the VPA annual reports a little bit more, a little bit less descriptive and, and a little bit more um, cr critical in terms of assessing the progress on, on, on transparency and maybe why not develop a scorecard. Uh, with respect to the EITI, as I said before, the EITI information is quite complex. Uh, communities certainly don't have access to the EITI portal, so it's important that um, EITI makes an effort to simplify the information on reconciliation, particularly for impacted communities. And Finally, and of course, uh, we know how difficult it is for civil society to operate in some of these countries because of uh, restriction, intimidation and harassment. It's really important that both the EITI and VPAs provide a safe space for civil society to analyze um, the information um, that is given to, de to demand access to that information. Um, the EITI is maybe a little bit more advanced because one of its requirements relates to a, a protocol on civil society participation, which needs to be independent, free and effective. Uh, there is not such a protocol for the VPA, although normally the deliberative uh, nature of the process ensures that everybody uh, is included. But it is still a problem and we're seeing that countries continue to adopt restrictive NGO legislation. And finally, finally, I wanted to, uh, to, to finish with that slide on uh, some resources um, that Fern has, uh, Fern has published a number of reports on transparency, looking at transparency more generally. And uh, there are also some useful resources from the EITI itself. Um, we should note that in some countries, including Cameroon and the Republic of Congo, NGOs have published transparency reports looking at the forestry but also the mining and agriculture sectors and these provide a lot of good information but very very little information about um, forest uh, revenues uh, and uh, I can also say that Fern plans to do more work on this including publishing a briefing note on EITI and forests and a note specifically on the um, on Congo to uh, to ensure that things can progress a little bit more rapidly. And uh, I'll leave it at that and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marie-Ange, and uh, please stay in the line for our discussions later on.
Um, but first, we move on to our um, last two speakers. First of all, uh, Hugh Speechley, independent, who is presenting on uh, FLECT in Myanmar. And I understand then the presentation will directly move into the presentation of Kerstin Kenby, um, who is Director of Forest Friends for his Policy, Trade, and Finance Initiative, and will then uh, present specifically on Myanmar's EITI forestry report. Okay, thanks. thanks very much. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, listen, my name is Hugh Speechley. Uh, I was involved in Myanmar's VPA from late 2015 until the end of last year, firstly as flag facilitator um, and then advisor to the Ministry of um, environmental conservation and natural resources, and finally, um, oversight of both of those roles. So I want to give you just a brief overview of the background of forestry in Myanmar and where FLAGD got to up to the end of last year. Just about the country itself, um, it's a very large country and very ethnically diverse. Um, there are 14 states and regions. The states are approximately those areas where ethnic groups are dominant, and the, the regions are what were formerly divisions where the uh, majority Bama ethnic group um, forms the main population. The total land area is uh, 678.5 thousand square kilometres, so it's large. There's a huge north-south distance from alpine areas on the eastern edge of the Himalayas in the north, to the south, which is moist tropics. It has a, a long land border, nearly 6,000 kilometers, with five neighboring countries, uh, Bangladesh, India, China, Laos, and Thailand. And uh, in addition to that, nearly 2,000 kilometers of coastline. So there are lots of opportunities for cross-border trade. The population is not all that big for a country of that size. There's, it's about between 50 and 55 million people, but it comprises over 100 different ethnic groups. And I list the, the major ones there, and you can see the Bama, which is the group where the country takes its um, <coughs> colonial name from, Burma, which forms the majority of the population, and the majority of those are Buddhist, and then a range of other groups um, uh, that, are normal, uh, that, that are based largely in the different states, and these can be combinations of Buddhist, Christian, and other religions. Um, now, let's see the, where the ethnic groups are. You, th there's a map of where their main uh, areas of uh, residence are, and you can see that links very closely of where the forests are. Um, I'm sure many of you will be aware that almost since independence, there, there have been wars going on between the center and the various ethnic groups who want more autonomy or independence. Um, part of that is because they want more uh, independence from being controlled by the central government and have a say of their own affairs, but a very important part of, of that is because of resources and forests and timber are a very important resource in this regard. So this is a problem that uh, Myanmar has been wrestling with 70 years since independence. Um, there's still violent conflict going on in many of the border areas. Um, Rakhine, you have heard about. You've heard about the Muslim refugees going to Bangladesh, but there's also another conflict going on between the ethnic Buddhist Rakhine and uh, the Union military. Uh, serious uh, clashes going on in northern Kachin state and also in eastern Shan state. Uh, let's look at the forestry. Um, uh, the, the forest area reduction um, has been about 10, 000, um, 10 million hectares since 1990, and this is based on the forest resource assessment data. So you can see that uh, 400,000 hectares have been lost since 1990, or about one. That, oh, sorry, that's 400,000 per year since 1990, about 1.2% of the forest area. But if you look at the last uh, five years, or, or the period 2010 to 2015, you'll see that the, the rate is considerably higher, 1.8% forest loss per year. And if you compare that with Indonesia, which is the country with 
in the region, certainly with the highest deforestation rate, you'll see the actual percentage rates, even though the areas are higher, are about half or less than the rates in Myanmar. So Myanmar has, a, has had a serious deforestation problem. Um, and it's interesting to note that in its contribution to tackling climate change, getting on top of uh, deforestation and reversing it is uh, its major goal. Some points about Myanmar forestry. Um, all state forests are managed by the Forest Department, which is under the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environmental Conservation. Um, the, the logging and timber sales is a monopoly of the Myanmar Timber Enterprise, which is a state-owned enterprise, but also comes under the same ministry. There are no forest concessions. From the 1990s, the Myanmar Timber Enterprise had to keep up with demands from the then military government to meet very, very demanding revenue targets. They didn't have the capacity to do it themselves, so they engaged contractors. And quite often those contracts were given to favored companies which had military links. And instead of paying them on a contract basis uh, with so much per cubic meter, they paid them in logs. And this created a huge parallel market for timber in the country, which uh, most of those went to exports. So there were huge volumes of, of exports that went out during the 90s and through to when the log export ban came in in 2014. Um, during that period, MTE was subject to US sanctions because at that point, it was uh, very, very close to the military and the senior officials within the, um, the organization were uh, often military or ex-military officials. Um, this led to quite a lot of offshore transfer of timber. So they, they would export to Thailand, Taiwan, Malaysia, Singapore, places like that. And so the country of origin for export would not be Myanmar, and that led to circumvention of the, of the sanctions. And then um, more recently, the uh, US Trade Association, the International Wood Pro Product Association, negotiated a waiver of the sanctions for its members uh, on the condition that they would help improve forest governance in Myanmar. Um, pretty much throughout the uh, recent history, there's been a large illegal cross-border trade with neighboring countries. Um, initially, it was with Thailand, when Thailand introduced its logging ban. Um, more recently, with China. And in 2014, there was a massive uh, uh, export of rosewood uh, across the border into Yunnan province. Uh, it, there was a, what appeared to be a sort of feeding frenzy, and it, it peaked at that level and then has dropped off. Um, since then, um, Myanmar and China have signed an MOU on forestry, and it appears that the, the trade uh, ha has dropped off considerably since then. Um, and incidentally, uh, Myanmar does not allow any cross-land border trade of forest products. So all the trade with neighbors that goes across the border, not out of one of the Yangon ports, is illegal. Um, when the log export ban was introduced in 2014, some of the big companies that had got fat off the timber sector left. Uh, there, there's still a few left, but, but the big ones have moved on to more profitable enterprises like jade mining and, and the mineral sector and real estate now. Um, in the 2016-17 logging season, the government had finally cottoned on that they had a real crisis on their hands and there was no logging at all um, during that season and the contract system was discontinued and from then, all sales of logs have been through open tender by MTE to the companies that buy the logs. And at that time, the annual harvest was significantly reduced. But it doesn't mean to say that illegal logging is sorted out. It's still a widespread problem. The flagged process. Uh, in 2014, the Myanmar government expressed interest in a VPA. Uh, they saw that their, the neighboring countries were starting to get into it, Indonesia, um, had uh, signed its VPA and was moving towards um, getting flag licensed timber. Malaysia had been involved in negotiations. Thailand, Laos had started, and Vietnam was negotiated well underway. So they, they, they could see benefits to doing that. At the same time, the EU made a grant to a local NGO uh, called 
EcoDev, it's now called itself Alarm, and they linked up with the Danish Church Aid to start a program on awareness raising on what FLED was all about, and they had sp specific programs in um, two regions and one state, in, in Kachin, in Tanatari in the south, and in the, the big logging uh, region of Sagai. Um, early 2015, um, a stakeholder workshop was held, and it was decided to launch the VPA preparation phase. And this really was taken by Myanmar as a commitment from the EU that uh, the EU was serious about starting to move towards VPA negotiations. Uh, a multi-stakeholder, 24-member interim task force was formed, and this, the, the idea of this was to prepare for VPA so that within a reasonable period of time, the negotiations could start. And uh, advisors for Monrec and a facilitator were engaged at about the same time. In June 2016, um, DFID support started, and there was a, an overall grant of 46 million pounds and a three-year project. Uh, this funded uh, uh, more facilitators and, a, and an advisor to the ministry, and it allowed stakeholder consultations to take place in all the states and regions. And this was the basis of forming multi-stakeholder groups. This is more formal structures to prepare for negotiations. So. As a result of these consultations, uh, a national multi-stakeholder group was formed. It, it had um, 28 members, uh, seven from each sector, uh, like the, the government, private sector, and civil society. And as well, in each of the states and regions, there were sub-multi-stakeholder groups. So uh, information could be transferred between them, and they could develop positions for negotiations. At the same time, the EU funded a communication strategy so that uh, th there was communication uh, on what FLED was and there was communication from the various stakeholder groups of what their concerns about forest and forest governance were. Uh, during that period also, the FAO uh, conducted a gap analysis of what Myanmar had developed. It was called the Myanmar Timber Legality Assurance System. Uh, this was based on largely ASEAN, the, 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 the regional grouping in Southeast Asia, definition of what a legality assurance system should be. It was pretty much designed without any stakeholder consultation, and certainly with no civil society consultation. And as a re result of that, civil society uh, rejected that as being any basis at all for uh, a possible VPA. Um, that continued to cause uh, quite a lot of friction between civil society and, and the government uh, in relation to whether that particular legality assurance system should be acceptable. Um, at the same time, and this was in response to EUTR sanctions or EUTR actions taken against Myanmar teak, which is being imported, uh, the government agreed to uh, prepare a, a document that actually opened up what its current supply chain process was. So that meant that every step in the supply chain from the de declaration of annual allowable cut, through logging, through timber transport and sales, through processing and loading on the ship, all the steps in that process were documented, described, where necessary translated from Burmese into English, because many of the documents were in Burmese. And so that document was made available, and it was the first time ever that these documents were available in one place. And this was really the result of the first Swedish EUTR case, which changed the game in many ways, from seeing flag, well, this is just another project, to this is really important for us because our trade depends on it. In November 2018, when we, I, I think we were just really starting to ramp up. As a response to the Rakhine crisis, where the, the um, 700,000 or more um, Rohingya refugees were driven across the border by the Myanmar military, DIFA decided to terminate support for the flag process. This was six months early. And this was just when we were sort of discussing with our counterparts there the possibility of extension, um, DIFA decided to stop support, uh, which was very unfortunate. Um, there is some FAO funding in place, but it's really insufficient to keep things going. But the Myanmar stakeholders, government, civil society, and the private sector have all committed 
they want to keep the process going. Um, so if there's any funders out there who want to keep it going, there's a possibility. So what happened as a result from FLAG? Certainly st stakeholder engagement was strengthened. The interim task force created a platform for deliberating uh, which hadn't been there before. Um, the capacity during that process to start to discuss difficult issues improved, although some of these meetings were, were fairly rough. Uh, the, just the fact that these people got together and developed personal relationships meant they could discuss some of these issues in a more um, uh, acceptable way. Uh, the s outreach to states and regions helped understand what local stakeholders considered important related to forest governance. So it wasn't just the government going out there telling people what to do, it was listening to what their, their concerns were. The process to uh, appoint the CSOs to the multi stakeholder group was largely democratic. So it, it was, the, the members were very much voted by um, their constituencies. Um, and now, even though the process itself is finished, the, the multi-stakeholder group is debating a new um, uh, version of what are the forest rules. These are the regulations that underpin a new forest law, which was passed late in 2018. This wouldn't have happened uh, had there been no multi-stakeholder group formed. Um, th there's improved government openness and transparency. I, in response to the EUTR cases, um, CSO monitoring and reporting is now accepted as being a way to identify where legal logging is going on, um, and there's certainly better communications with the media. Sure, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just looking at the time, and I want to this allow... Is, this, is, this is the uh, second to last slide. Oh, okay. Please uh, okay. be quick. I'm sorry. Um, it, it, just uh, in response to EIA reports in the EUTR cases, the Competent Authority's current view is that it's not possible for operators to come to a neg negligible risk assessment due to the specific situation in Myanmar. And therefore, trade in teak in Myanmar cannot continue to flow unless the problems in Myanmar are resolved. Now, despite that, there's still teak coming into the EU. Um, Monarch has accepted the need for greater transparency. So the documentation of um, supply chain controls, provision of documents on t timber supplies, access to forest areas for buyers and representatives, including independent auditors, and access to forest areas for CSOs to report on illegal logging. Uh, there's still need for improvements. I mean, a clear vision for FLEGT. Um, it's still, to some extent, regarded as another project. There's need for more trust building between and within stakeholder groups, but this is not surprising, consider, considering the state is uh, the state where it got to. The big issue of how to link flag to the peace process, what to do with timber from the ethnic areas that are controlled by ethnic groups, um, how can you make sure that flag doesn't uh, undermine a very delicate peace process. There's a view that government agencies, if they say a supply is legal, they should be believed. Um, there's no need to demonstrate proof or have this independent verification. And it's very difficult to get the documents. Um, and it may be impossible for the early harvest um, uh, from which the log part is uh, still comprised the, the most of the supply. Uh, there's an MOU with China on forestry, but it's still secret. Uh, so we don't really know what's going on there. So thank you very much for that. Okay, now let's move on to the EITI of Myanmar. Um, so we've already gone through a little bit of the history of what is the EITI, so I can move kind of quickly through that. Um, one of you know the big things that we are really pushing with the EITI in Myanmar is where is the money that's being collected by these massive natural resources that are present in Myanmar, the jade, the gems, oil and gas, and the forestry. Where are those revenues going and are they benefiting um, the citizens of Myanmar? So this is just sort of my transition slide of what does the EITI look for? You go everything from the contracts and licenses, it looks into production, it looks into revenue collection, and then the revenue allocation and what are, is the contribution to the social and economic um, welfare of the country. Um, why did Myanmar add 
a forestry report. It wasn't required by the EITI. Um, the government committed to the EITI in 2013 and went forward with its oil and gas and mining reports. Um, but then forestry was added about two years ago. And how did that happen? It really was CSO pressure. Um, I'm going to give credit to a large part to the Myanmar Accountability and, Trans and Transparency Association, which has more than 450 um, civil societies um, members, and they're from all Myanmar's, all, all Myanmar's 14 states and regions. And so this really was locally owned. There wasn't a lot of support. There was no push from the international EITI secretariat who actually, from the previous presentation, there's not a lot of global experience with forestry under the EITI. So I think, if anything, everyone thinks this is a weird beast. We don't really know how to handle it. There's not a lot of lessons learned or, or templates for this. And there wasn't donor money specifically for the forestry report. I think the World Bank kicked in some money. And um, for the past two or three years, uh, Forest Trends has been providing technical assistance and training. Um, I forgot to mention that this is work being done under the leadership of Art Blundell, who works with Forest Trends, and he has experience with the Liberia AITI. And so he's been working with us in Myanmar on this. So he can't be here today, so I'm giving this presentation, but it's really his work. So the fact that civil society had such a strong say to be able to put forest to get forestry on the map of the EITI was really um, a, a really sh a good strong show of local ownership, and it was clear that CSOs had a seat and a clear role in decision making on the multi-stakeholder group um, decision making process for the Myanmar EITI. So the first forest report came out in January 2019. It does not have everything that Marie Ange says that an EITI report has, but it's a start. It only covered fiscal years 2014, 2015, because really it started, the whole thing, the whole idea started two years ago, so they were working with the best available data at that point. Um, I'm not going to skip over this part with Liberia, because I think it was already talked about, but that was, is sort of the model. And Myanmar and Liberia share some important characteristics. They're both post-conflict states, actually Myanmar is still in conflict. Um, so there's conflict timber tensions in, with a country that has a highly valuable timber sector. So forestry is part of the dynamics of the simmering tensions in Myanmar. Revenues from the forests are not um, coming on the ground to the, to the communities that are actually bearing the biggest brunt of the environmental destruction um, from the forest operations. And I just... I clicked a button with my foot, so now I can't see my little screen here, so I'm going to now look over here. So what are the findings? Don't get depressed. There are a lot of discrepancies. It's not the findings that are important. It's the dialogue that has started. One of the first things that you get from the EITI was the first list of all the companies that are operating. What are the payments that are making? That aren't they're making? Are they taxes? What are they exporting? Um, and some of the analysis was based on sort of a priority of their analysis was, was um, based on thresholds of payments. Those were the priority that were looked into more in depth. What we didn't get, though, and that's something that EITI is going to require in the future, is beneficial ownership. So we may have the names of the companies, but we don't know who owns them. It's theoretically possible that the same man owns all these companies. So you really need to know who is the beneficial ownership to see what, what the links are, whether there's someone in government who's also a part owner of a company, for example. We found um, a lot of discrepancy in the reporting of production. On the left, is a table where the source is the Myanmar Timber Enterprise reporting on production of teak. On the right is a slightly different table, but it's from the forestry department and also is supposed to be telling us about the production of teak. So there are lots of numbers. It's hard. You really, the report itself isn't that hard to read, but you really have to understand the sector to understand what's going on and what's missing and, and how, to, how this all fits together. So we kind of, we've done a little infographic. What you need to know, teak log production, the annual allowable cut was 111,000 hoppus tons. The MT reported cutting 104, but the forestry department reported 275. 
And so maybe it's not surprising that the MTE was reporting sales that was greater than the availability of supply that it was coming from harvesting, stockpiles, and confiscations. So I'm not going to say this is what's actually happening. I'm saying the data doesn't quite work. There was another table which shows that um, profits are higher than sales. If you can do that, we're all millionaires. So um, there was interesting things going on with royalties and income tax payments, payments that did not increase even when royalty rates increase. There was unclear um, re variations according to the region. So that could be a sign of undue discretion in royalty collection. So we saw a little correlation between volumes of, report, of reported pr production and income tax payments reported by the companies. Um, I love the trade charts. So the government um, reported $14 million of sales to China. China Customs reported $374 million. Those are mainly logs and mostly coming in through Kung, Kunming, which is an overland border crossing. So those during a log export ban time, as well as a, um, illegal to trade over the border, those would have been majority illegal. And FAO data reported even higher numbers. Um, and the companies themselves, 121 companies reported teak exports. But of those, 51 didn't report harvesting or purchasing any teak. So there's a question, where did they get that from? 48 others reported exports, but also <clears throat> did not purchase or um, harvest as much as they said they exported. So clearly something's going on, but we don't know. Um, inconsistent pricing of raw materials. 13 companies reporting paying more per ton to the MTE for teak logs than they reported as export prices. So this, um, this, this EITI force report, it didn't cover contracts and licenses. And so we're hoping that the next report will be able to get in depth there. It also didn't really get into revenue collection and the, where the money was actually being allocated to in the union budget. We found that the distribution of MTE profits during this time, roughly $1 billion, 26% of it went to the union budget. The other 74%, and this is profit, stayed in what's called MTE other accounts. And this also happened in the other state-owned enterprises, they're called SEEs in Miami for um, gemstones, oil, and mining. What are these other accounts? It's a big mystery. The good news is that whether it's because of the EITI or other things that are going on in the country, is that now these other accounts are being seriously looked at. So no one really knew what happened to this money. There were some reports, oh, it was being used for education projects or health projects. But that's rather strange that there's no oversight. The MTE, it has oversight over funding that's going to health and education. Um, so what are the impacts? Awareness, there has been a lot of training and dialogue that's leading to transparency. Um, training of government, training of the multi-stakeholder group, training of CSOs, both in Yangon and in the regions, and with journalists. And the Yangon Journalism School is now involved and, and being trained. And there's an official launch, not this week, but next week, there will be um, CSOs will get together to define a strategy. There'll be an official launch on Thursday. And then on Friday, there's a workshop which will discuss the findings, but also um, begin to hopefully, it's on the agenda, a roadmap for reform, perhaps more realistically, a roadmap for a roadmap for reform. The response of the government has been fairly, fairly good. Um, a lot of it is, oh, we've already taken care of it. This was 2014, 2015 data. The NGOs are already preparing their response to that response and expectation of that response, saying, great, show us, let's see, let's start working it out. Um, in June 2018, the government of Myanmar created a beneficial ownership task force to address the problem I addressed, addressed earlier, which is going to be critical in terms of addressing potential corruption and conflict of interest. And um, 
I think I'm going to mention it in the slide here, just a few weeks ago, they have confirmed that they're going to do another two sets of forestry to cover the, the, following, the following the years, the latest data. For a while there, we were worried that this report might um, scare people away from doing second um, follow-up reports, but so far it's been confirmed they're going to start doing that report, and I've already seen a draft in terms of reference for this. Um, maybe we've already kind of gone through this, but we know the EITI goal, what industry says it pays is what government says it's collect and payments ultimately benefit Myanmar citizens. Um, you know, the TLAS, as it's designed, it may ensure that all payments are being made. So that could be, there could be an overlap there. Um, but frankly, I think we need all eyes on the forest right now. So this is another way of triangulation. It's another way of getting a data from another vantage point. And so right now, I think it's great that there are two different processes going on. Um, and the MEATI, is, it's not an audit of the TLAS system, but it can identify ways where, where payment systems go awry that possibly the TLAS won't be able to get into. The EI, the, um, the EITI forest report also has a little bit of a benefit in that it links with broader reforms. There is a, of, of the state-owned enterprises overall and sort of the whole public finance, the way that public finance is structured in Myanmar. Um, I picked out a, a sentence here. It's improving data availability and accessibility and development of better systems for the certification, traceability, and valuation of blank. I was like, oh, that's timber. No, that's for gemstones. I think that is the same, same issues in gemstones as we have for timber. And so there is, and gemstones in the oil and gas are actually much bigger sectors in Myanmar. So we do have a benefit of a need to be able to sort of put our, what is it, um, to, go, to go along with the other sectors all, oh, as well. Some of the overall SAE reform would be hard for um, Monrec to the ministry to do, to, to do alone. Um, and it has a lot to do with the peace process. The ethnic organizations are very interested in the findings. Um, the, you know, these ethnic grievances are continuing to stall the peace process, and so this question of where is the money going is very central to the peace process. There you go. Thank you very much to all speakers. I would like to invite you to come back to the stage and we have approximately 15 minute, minutes left for questions. I'm sure there are many questions. Uh, we take them again in, in groups of three and we start over here with the first question, then the lady in the back and then here. Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Steve Ree from the Ford Foundation uh, based in the Indonesia office. Really appreciated all of your presentations. And it seems to me in my head, being based in Indonesia and dealing with uh, uh, EITI, VPA and all of the natural resource governance issues, one thing that's clearly being felt in Indonesia and I'd imagine in the places where you're working and, and reporting on is the influence of Chinese development finance. Right, and also the consumption patterns of the Chinese markets for various commodities. So I guess the question is to what extent uh, do EITI and VPA and the things that uh, you all are reporting on and working on uh, resonate uh, with the Chinese uh, government's uh, Belt Road Initiative, for example, right? So we can use that as an umbrella. Because it seems to me without some sort of buy-in or a collaboration with them, uh, the incentive structures that they are setting up, both market and policy-wise, uh, uh, fundamentally override and are much bigger than the things we're working on here in this room and that you all presented. So I'm just curious about the sort of where does China come in into the conversation, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Laurence Wetesso. I'm from Cameroon, and I work for FUDE, a civil society organization. I have a couple of questions to Marie-Ange and Kristen, and then uh, to Clotilde. Uh, my question to Marie-Ange and Kristen is, in practice, what is the added value of a VPA country to include forests in EITI? 
from Marie Ange uh, presentation, she said VPA, and I, I agree, VPA high, has higher recommendation or requirement than EITA, uh, and that from the Kingston uh, presentation, all those discrepancies that comes uh, from the report, EITA report, does it not bring a kind of overlap for a VPA country to have a, a EITA, a for, EITA for forest? Uh, is it, in, in summary, is it not a, more, a tool more or another tool uh, that in practice bring uh, no real change? To Clotilde, my question is, uh, thank you for all the information I got uh, concerning CBCR. Uh, I acknowledge that it's new information for uh, me also as civil society organization worker. And I want to know uh, what payments are taken into consideration here? Is it only legal payment or does this payment includes also the informal payment. If it doesn't include uh, the informal payment, is it not another obstacle for the effectiveness of uh, this uh, regulation? Thank you. Okay, we have the third question over here. Thank you all. Um, I'm Alec Dawson, I'm from the Environmental Investigation Agency. Um, as you mentioned, we recently released a report on some of the corruption issues within Myanmar. i um, just got a question for Kristen and Hugh, talked about Myanmar. Um, releasing that report, um, one of the responses that we got from the MTE was, this is old news, there's none of that happening anymore here. Um, and similarly, they officially say that they've massively reduced the logging quota and the amount of logging has massively gone down. Um, what do you guys think about the capacity to verify claims like that going forward? Do you think it's possible at the moment? What do you think the tools are available to do that? Um, w when do you think we'll have some of the data that you're using about a few years ago to verify some of the things they're saying about uh, logging and corruption now? Okay, first question, sorry, first question. Uh, was uh, from Indonesia influence of China. Who would like to respond to that? Um, yeah, it's a very important question because obviously um, you have still have quite a lot of cross-border trade. Um, are you, including charcoal, which has fallen under the radar, which is huge volumes going across. Um, the, as I say, there's an MOU that was signed in May last year between China and Myanmar, which had the aim of get, getting um, some sort of control over that trade. I mean, it, previously, it, it seemed to be that the responsibility was delegated to the Yunnan government, which is, is the main um, province of China on the border. Um, I think Beijing took it up and sort of told um, Yunnan to get that in order. But as I say, the actual content of the MOU is not publicly available, um, so actually what the details are aren't clear. Um, I think more broadly in terms of um, the, the, the overall Belt and Road, um, I mean, it's probably something that Dermot or Thomas Pichet in this room might, you know, they're dealing with the InFit2 program in China. They may be better able to answer if you want to take that um, one offline later. Thank you very much. The second question um, was from Cameroon on the added value of including the forest sector and the EITI. That was to Marie-Ange. Marie, uh, are you still there? Yeah. Yes, I'm still here. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. Thanks to Laurence uh, for her question. 
Uh, I would say there are two main reasons why it's interesting for a VPA country to implement the EITI. First of all, the EITI reconciliation provides extra strength to the, the data that is published. There is no such thing as reconciliation uh, under the VPA because the companies have to report and governments um, also have to publish and the information is required reconciled independently, then it provides a strong basis for citizens, but also uh, governance, stakeholders, etc., to um, to trust that the information is, um, is genuine. And the second, uh, I would say, added value is that the EITI publishes reports on an annual basis, so you'll get data um, per fiscal year, and this information can then be discussed by the public, citizens and communities, and they can see whether the government uh, has received what um, it should have received, whether companies are receiving the benefits that they're entitled to, etc. So I would say the reconciliation and also the timeliness, but maybe Kirsten has other uh, ideas. Yes. Thank you. And then there was one question directly. Would you like to add? Sorry. I'll, no. I'll answer when I answer the third question. Okay. <laughs> then there was yes, a question. In relation to, to the, second, the second question about uh, informal payments, um, thank you very much for this question. Um, I'm not the legislator, but I would say that it's probably quite complicated to integrate uh, this kind of payment formally into the law. However, if we think of uh, good systems that, you, that should uh, uh, function to improve transparency, at the end of the day, that should help to capture this type of informal payments. So basically, if we have more clarity and more transparency about all those payments, and that we also get clarity about which entity within the government is receiving the payment, um, what type of payment should be included. That, that's why when the EU legislation is um, uh, talking about a certain set of payments, we need to make sure that there are guidelines about uh, the interpretation of them. We need to make sure as well that they are um, wider than they are at the moment to make sure that it could encompass all the type of payments that, uh, that uh, might not yet uh, be within the scope of the regulation. And if civil society members have more clarity about this kind of payments, they, it should, at the end of the day, give a, a chance of noticing where some informal payments could have been made, basically, and therefore uh, start to ask questions rather to the companies or to governments. Okay, and then on the last question. Um, yeah, you're, you're right, and the MTE is right, and this is old data, and not only is it older data, but it was also during a previous administration. Um, I think what we have to applaud here is this was a first start. Um, the, it, there is, as I said before, there is not a lot of experience with forestry reporting on your, the EITI structure, so there was a lot of learning by doing. Um, so I think I'll be able to report more um, next week, because I will be in Burma for all these meetings, and as I noted, the NGOs are already anticipating that response, and so they will have more sort of ammunition and very specifics. But the, the good news is that since the launch and in anticipa anticipation of next week, we're already seeing some government responses saying, well, that, that number over there isn't quite right. You need to look at this data. So already you have to realize how hard it is to get information like this out of the forestry department or the MTE. So the fact that we got the information out the, the EITI, and now we can begin, and the, and the new terms of reference for the new reports being more specific on, well, you also have to include this or that. So we are in the process of adapting uh, or, or providing advice for how can you adapt the survey to get additional information that may give clarity to all these things that we're looking at right now that don't make sense. So um, I'll, you know, talk to me in a week and I'll say what the NGOs Said. So I think it is a start, and I think it'll be very interesting to see what the next reports will say. Thank you. I would like to allow one last and very quick round of questions. Uh, we have one over there. Um, thank you very much indeed, um, Ewan Grant. Um, I've worked in the ex-Soviet states with law enforcement agencies, so. Uh, I've seen how the deep state works. Um, isn't all this really a bit of a joke where the key interests 
of a deep state like China are involved. And quickly follow up on a specific on that point. There's a very interesting comment made that uh, something's going on in Myanmar because the statistics are so heavily out of kilter. Uh, we don't know what. Has the EITI Secretariat in Oslo made any attempt to come to conclusions at what might be going on? Because frankly, it doesn't take a lot to inform some awkward questions. Thank you. Yes, then we have one more question over here. Thank you very much. My name is Nibali Warnon, and I'm from Liberia, uh, associated with client IF as in country associate. I work as the first head of the Liberia EITR program, and I went to the level of becoming a member of the EITR board. And I've had the opportunity of working with the Librarian VPA process. So I just wanted to acknowledge the beautiful presentations on the complementarity of VPA and EITI. I wanted to make two points. I think for the process to work, one has to focus on contrast transparency so that there's a fair opportunity of knowing what the government should have received and what it did receive. And then two, we need not put undue emphasis on data quality. I think it's an essential value that some reports are made. And I, I, I wanted to agree with Marianne on her point about Liberia EIT data quality on the forestry sector. I think the EIT is very clear that the data should not be published but it should be published in a widely accessible and understandable manner. And that the publication of the data is not an end in itself, but it should generate a governance discussion. And I think we should see it in this context, whether it's for MEITI or the Liberia Data Quality. Let us not focus on the international secretariat, but in-country multi-stakeholder processes, the sort of conversation they have. And in that respect, you will agree that every publication, no matter how disjointed and not consistent the data will be, is a big plus as we improve forest governance. And I indeed, you did well from my point, and having worked with the EITR for a number of years, up to the validation committee and the Liberia VPA process, that there's significant complementarity between the two and that starting with one almost always makes it easier to get to the other, either through civil society pressure or other stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> On the first question, Hugh, you would like to respond to um, The deep state, yes. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer too much about the deep state, but one thing um, I think is important, when the reforms started um, 2012, 2013, uh, it was very clear that Myanmar wanted to reduce its dependency on China. Um, I mean, this came to a head over a large dam project in Kachin State, the Mitsone Dam, uh, which was subject to a lot of um, local pressure, and eventually the Myanmar government um, suspended the contract and it's still suspended now and so opening up to the West was very much to counter Chinese influence. Um, the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative um, and the, the, the impact of the Rakhine crisis have probably tempered that and certainly China has now, um, it sees that as an opportunity to um, increase its influence and you know the what, what China wants is access to the Indian Ocean, so between the, the Yunnan border and, um, and um, Rakhine province, building a deep water port there, rail and gas line. So the, the political position of Myanmar is very important in this regard. Um, I, I think Myanmar will uh, continue to play off different sides to the extent it can. Thank you very much. Okay, we are 
a little bit over time. Before uh, closing the session, there are a few notes. For those who are not joining us tomorrow, there are evaluation forms on the table over there. Please take one and fill them out. Um, for those who are joining us tomorrow, please keep your name budgets and bring them tomorrow. And then we will uh, now meet upstairs for drinks and have more opportunities to discuss. I would like to thank our speakers um, for their really interesting presentations, you for the questions and discussions, and see you upstairs. Thank you. Thank you.